Hi folks, welcome to IIIoT, where we will be discussing wrangling and defending against the risks of unmanaged devices in a multi-part series. My name is Eric Poynton, now let's dive right in. So first, a quick agenda for this series. I'll walk through who I am, uh, why IoT research is a notable and you know, worthy area of cybersecurity research in 2021. We'll then walk through the methodologies utilized to perform this research, as well as so several different classifications of real world examples. And finally, some takeaways for our enterprise defenders out there. So quick, um, who am I? My name is Eric Poynton, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm a threat research specialist at AWAKE, the NDR security division of Arista Networks. I do not have any formal security education, but I'm often found happily falling down rabbit holes at work. So why IoT in 2021? As we can see by this chart uh, given to us by Armis, that in 2020 alone, there are more than 10 billion IoT and unmanaged devices in the enterprise. Um, and that vastly outnumbers the number of BYOD, so PC and mobile devices, uh, and tra traditional enterprise um, devices as well. So why IoT? Uh, given this screenshot was taken from a NetScout report um, that mentions that once, in, once plugged into the network, IoT devices are attacked within five minutes, and within 24 hours, they are typically targeted by specific exploits. Um, and so this really goes to show that enterprises need a concrete uh, and formalized plan for IoT devices to secure them uh, and segregate them from, from the main networks within enterprises before that they before they actually bring them online. Um, otherwise, this will present a massive risk to the organization. This headline taken from Hacker Noon uh, reads, our industrial infrastructure is a ticking time bomb. Uh, and this is where some of my research was featured in. Uh, and we will absolutely dive into the specific piece that was mentioned here um, in a later part in this series. Lindsay O'Donnell uh, in March of 2020 um, put this out and she said a full 98% of IoT device traffic is unencrypted, exposing personal and confidential data on the network. And we will certainly dive into many of these findings that show um, that she is rather correct in this statement. And so more than half of all IoT devices are vulnerable to medium or high severity attacks, meaning that enterprises are sitting on a ticking IoT time bomb, according to Palo Alto Network's Unit 42 research team. So in part two, we will discuss the research uh, methodologies that we utilized here at AWAKE to determine what IoT devices look like on the network, um, as well as the risks that they present to networks. Today, we're gonna dive into the research that was performed for this. So the hypothesis that we started out with was that by analyzing the collection of network behaviors from a device over time, it is possible to distinguish IoT and OT devices from mobile devices, BYOD systems, corporate infrastructure, and enterprise devices. We did this by leveraging all customer and research environments to identify how different classes of devices appear on the network. So let's start with enterprise device, devices. Um, so we can see here that you know, enterprise devices will typically use corporate authentication mechanisms. They'll have uniform naming schemas, as we can see up here. Um, they will use many ap applications and they will typically exist for long periods of time. In this instance, right, this has been on the network for a little over 42 weeks um, and utilizes a rather uniform naming scheme of PC3064. Um, and so let's jump into BYOD systems. Um, these systems do not use corporate authentication mechanisms um, and various naming schemas. As we can see here, we have Amazon EDE 64370D0 and then Liz's Air. Um, other scheme, you know, other namings will be you know, Jen's MacBook Pro, for example, maybe Joe's Surface, maybe the specific device model, so on and so forth. Um, we'll see that they, at the bottom here, they will use many applications. Um, and then we'll also be able to see personal email addresses attached to these devices as well. 
Mobile devices, uh, much like BYOD devices, do not use corporate authentication mechanisms um, and again have various naming schemes, such in this instance, Brad's Droid, um, other examples, Karen's iPhone, Lauren's iPad, so on and so forth, possibly even the device model as, as mentioned with the BYOD devices. Um, again, typically going to use many applications, right? The smartphones kind of exist uh, with all of their app stores. Um, and you know, one of the draws to smartphones is all the applications on them and that you can download on them. Um, again, we'll often see personal email addresses at some point in time. They'll also move around a lot, right? We see these devices coming and going to the network each day. So they'll often have a lot of IP addresses um, and typically have mostly browser traffic in the protocol breakdown. Corporate infrastructure, um, these will sometimes utilize corporate authentication mechanisms depending on the device class. Um, again, these are going to exist for very long periods of time. Generally do not use DHCP, therefore they have typically have a static IP address assigned to them um, and typically you know, very few or zero applications actually running on them. Um, and in this instance, right, we can see that the vast majority of protocol usage for this device was DC, RPC, SMB, LDAP, uh, and then some DNS, right? All makes sense for, you know, internal, um, you know, possibly file shares or things like that, but that all makes sense for, you know, a server 2012 R2. IoT devices, on the other hand, do not match any of the previous profiles. Um, a lot of them will often use proprietary, so on parse protocols at some point or time. Um, they'll often learn the environment via multicast, Sometimes they have specific naming schemas, as we can see here on this screenshot. Uh, and this screenshot is a similarity, a similarity graph um, to tell us which devices in the network are similar to one another and how they are similar. Um, but in this screenshot, we can see that these are a collection of different Apple TVs that are scattered across the office um, and the entire kind of campus enterprise here. Um, sometimes they will have another so uh, another trait of IoT devices, right? Just like the Apple TVs. Um, sometimes we'll see a high number of similar devices, right? In this instance, um, you know, we're seeing Apple TVs scattered throughout the campus buildings so that they can, you know, project, you know, run their slideshows in, in unison. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll often see a lot of cameras, right? That also makes sense. Here's kind of security cameras um, and how they will also have, you know, several similar devices. Um, because they are, you know, placed throughout the campus environment or enterprise environment in order to provide, you know, physical security with that. And so that wraps up part two, the research that was done. Um, thanks for tuning in and be sure to tune in to part three, which will be real world examples. We'll cover some benign but interesting uh, use cases. This is part three, where we, where we will start diving into real world examples. This section is uh, some benign but interesting findings. Jump right in. All right, so let's work left to right here. Um, so first we can see that we have a PlayStation um, device. Rather interesting to see that in a corporate uh, enterprise network. We can see it's been on the, the network for uh, one week. Um, and moving a little bit to the right here, we can see that we've identified different Raspberry Pis on the network um, as well. And then further here on the right, we can see that based on characteristic artifacts, uh, which Awake utilizes to show analysts what are um, the rather notable and interesting artifacts from a device and the traffic that it emits, that you know really showcase that this device is unique. So these are the these are the artifacts that separate this device from all the other devices out on the network. And we can see here that on the from the characteristic artifacts. This has been reaching out to Amazon Alexa um, with both DNS and TLS as well. And another device has been doing that as well. And so diving into this traffic, we confirm that this device was Amazon Alexa's, um, which you know is a rather interesting device to have in a corporate enterprise, given the fact that you know, they are always on and listening and learning um, and things like that. So there's definitely some risks to have that, especially if you put them in sensitive rooms, um, but I digress. Moving down here to this uh, big screenshot, again, this is a similarity graph of the devices that are on the network. Um, we can see, again, utilizing the characteristic artifacts um, that this is a Crestron Electrics um, device, which is utilized for home automation, campus and building control. Um, and we can see that, you know, this does not utilize any, going back to part, previous part of this, right? We're looking at the, how these devices 
will have different naming schemas and how oftentimes IoT devices, you really won't follow kind of any naming schema. Uh, and this is another example of that where there really are no device names associated here. Um, and there's really not much of a pattern that they actually follow. And so in this instance, right, you know, we're able to pick up the entire all of the devices that are used with this um, via similarity analysis to determine that these are all acting similar and therefore, you know, very much related. And the way that they are related is through their characteristic artifacts going out to the TLS server cert organization, uh, which is crash on elect electronics. This is a, again, uh, another similarity graph here. Um, and so these are all conference rooms um, and we can see that, you know, they are all interconnected in a, in a numerous different ways here. Um, and, but what's most interesting about this is, you know, the device in the middle here, we can see is a much higher value um, than all of the other devices in the network, right? You can imagine, you know, tapping into this device, you know, somewhere to where do gain uh, access that should not have access to this device they would then be able to listen in on all of the CEO and, you know, conference room uh, conversations, right? And one can imagine, you know, how much sensitive information is really being discussed in that room um, and proprietary information. Um, so this presents a pretty high risk uh, in terms of corporate espionage, um, depending on, you know, who this organization is and, you know, what their purpose is in the world. Um, but corporate es espionage is definitely very alive and very real. That wraps up part three of benign but interesting findings. Uh, tune back in for, uh, we will t jump into more real world examples uh, where we will look, take a look at compliance-based findings. In this section, we will cover compliance-based findings. Let's jump right in. Quick reminder of these from part one, uh, which simply note that, you know, the vast majority of IoT devices uh, send traffic unencrypted across the internet and more than half of these devices are vulnerable to medium or high severity attacks. Um, and this Hacker Noon uh, article, as I mentioned, we will dive into that finding. Um, and so let's do that now. So these are exercise bikes that are sending logs out in plain text over HTTP out across the internet. Um, we can see here that they are receiving a 200 OK response to the post, the post request, uh, indicating that they were successful re uh, requests. And so within these logs, we have an absolute plethora of sensitive user information. Um, we can see at the very top here, and this is all obfuscated, of course, to protect our users, um, but we can see the account name, password, station name, MAC address, and where it's going. And if we take a look at the data that's being sent out in these logs, we can see the location name, the location, uh, you know, short name for it. We see the software model. Um, the user nickname, the user first name, last name, email address, age, age range, gender, um, whether their height, their weight, their Facebook status, their use, their Twitter status, um, if they so choose to enable that. Um, we'll also take a look at their heart rate and how long they've worked out for in time, distance, calories, the amount of laps, and the overall score uh, that that workout was given. So really a plethora of information um, and very easy to pivot off this information to do further damage. Next up, we have a smart TV. Uh, and again, these are doing plain, plain text check-ins, um, calling back home. Uh, and these have both device specific details, network details and access details. And so we can see here on the right, we can see uh, that the awake platform fully parses out um, the whole entire request body. And we can see the access key, the access secret, the device MAC, the Wi-Fi MAC address, uh, the chip ID, the chip model, in this instance, it's not known, um, and the actual product model itself, which was a Dream TV innovation. Next up, we have an Amazon Fire TV cube, uh, which was doing UPnP um, enumeration and reporting. And so I mentioned in the previous part, uh, the concept of characteristic artifacts or fingerprints I and mean, fingerprints are really the artifacts that make this device um, notable and rather unique on the network. Um, so Wake is constantly doing kind of similarity analysis to see how devices are related to one another in the network. Um, and the, the notable and unique values will appear here under fingerprints tab of the device entity IQ device profile. And so in this instance, right, 
we can see that they are actually utilizing uh, HTTP request user agent for UPnP. Um, and then we can see down here that, you know, they're making thousands of requests out to different devices in the network over varying different ports. Um, and this is one of some one of the only devices do, utilizing this um, kind of enumeration of reporting in the network. If we move on, we can see a little bit more of this traffic in the workbench, which is where uh, Awake will display the individual connections and activities uh, that these devices are performing. Um, and so we can see here, you know, get root description, which is an XML file, um, and continues to go down uh, various other devices um, in order to first ping to see if there's connectivity, uh, and then again to um, understand you know, more about that device through UPnP enumeration. And further more so, we can actually look at the actual packets that uh, that are in these communications. So clicking on some of the activities from the previous screen will lead us here. Um, and looking at the capture data, we can actually see that this is a Roku device um, and we can get all information about the manufacturer, the manufacturer URL, the model description, the model name, model number, URL, serial number, um, UUID, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, we can see um, that when the device goes to enumerate one of the other devices in the network, um, we can see that it's actually pulling back the server name, product version, or sorry, protocol version, product version, and server ID, and the specific port that it can be utilized to talk to. Um, so very interesting information, uh, something that we might not expect from an Amazon Fire TV cube, um, but nonetheless, here we are. And we'll look at another example of this as well. We can see the actual device name here. We can see some of the connection made of metadata, um, the service hash and the account hint, uh, and then the device type as well. Um, and then some more, you know, exchange device services. Uh, and so we can actually see what services are running on this particular endpoint here. Moving on, we have some Shure IoT audio devices utilizing basic uh, authorization, which is base64 encoded credentials. Um, and just a reminder, encoded does not equal encrypted, as we can see here. Um, and so we can see that it's you know utilizing basic author authorization to authenticate into that device and it's using a libcurl user agent. And then that device will uh, give back the actual um, device name, the description, the version, the release dates, um, and so on and so forth here. The interesting notes about these findings are, you know, while this connection happened uh, just a few weeks ago in you know, the third quarter of 2021, um, you know, we can see that the release date for the firmware that these devices are running was released in 2016. Um, so very old firmware. Um, and it has been noted that, you know, some of these devices are vulnerable uh, to attacks. In fact, uh, Grimm actually put out a research paper in about June of 2021, noting that exactly. And the list really goes on here um, as far as compliance findings go. Um, we've seen smart beverage systems phoning home and play text with Wi-Fi information, um, HVAC system managed via RDP, uh, remotely by a vendor. Um, and the, one of the more interesting ones was a dozens of remote uh, ATM communications communicating back the location and customer transaction across the internet in straight plain text. And that wraps up uh, part four, our compliance-based findings. Uh, thanks for tuning in and be sure to tune in for part five, where we will take a look at malicious findings. All right, so jumping right in. Um, here we have a BeagleBone recon on the network. Uh, this was found in a utility company. It was the only one in the network. It was recently introduced, as we can see here by the first scene. Uh, and this was enumerating the entire network and was accessible via SSH. Next up, we have some highly vulnerable video cameras uh, being scanned internally, and this was not from a known internal scanner. All right, next up, we have uh, some Raspberry Pis. Uh, this was in a financial company, and this was also new to their network. Um, and we can see here that this device triggered a model match for defense evasion IoT device using TeamViewer remote access tool. Um, and here are some of the connections that we can see um, where they're sending a good bit of data uh, for a very long period of time that is 33 hours long 
Um, so, you know, these devices were being utilized um, really, you know, as kind of a, a jump host within the network. Next up, we have a water controller uh, OT system. And this was using a uh, Ruffin remote access tool. And we can see that this connection lasted for about an hour and a half uh, with a good bit of data here. And it was using a tool called Remote Utilities. And the interesting thing about this tool um, really is that, you know, it can be used as a jump host, right? We can see the different functionalities. And this is only uh, a short list of the functionalities. It's actually uh, has a, a rather long list of interesting functionalities that these devices could be used for. Um, but we can see it can be used for unattended access, attended access. Um, it can, you know, basically remove uh, user access control. Um, and as you can see here that that is no longer an obstacle. Uh, it can utilize RDP over ID, unlimited one to many sessions. Uh, it can be used as a self-hosted server, proxy server support, um, and can also, you know, connect through a host, as I mentioned. Um, and we can see that this was the device utilizing this software um, was actually a Windows uh, Server 2003. Uh, again, that was in charge for, in charge of um, controlling a water treatment facility. Uh, and here are just some of the connections from there, some, some of the activity logs, um, and just some notes from Wired. Uh, hackers gain direct access to US power grid controls. Um, and you know, in this semantic says, uh, and yes, most signs point to Russia, which makes the fact that this device is utilizing a Russian made tool a little bit more interesting. Um, and then Alex Orleans from FireEyes just says that the grid is still getting hit. Next up, we have a smart board at a utility company, uh, again, using the Russian remote access tool, uh, remote utilities, as well as TeamViewer. And this was uh, exfiltrating data as well. And so if we look at the username, we can see that this, you know, where will give us a pretty good indication of where this device is located. Um, and so the username here is SCADA2. Um, and then looking at the fingerprints, uh, again, which are the unique and notable um, network artifacts emitted from this device that really separate this device apart from the others. Um, we can see that it's using a utilities smart board uh, as a Kerberos server name, and it's using uh, protocol team viewer um, and reaching out to teamviewer.com and remoteutilities.com. Taking a look at these connections that we've seen from this device, we can see that this was utilizing TeamViewer, again, for a good bit of data uh, for about an hour long connection. Uh, and Trend Micro notes that you know, modified TeamViewer tool can drop church and spyware onto victims, um, which makes this finding a little bit more interesting. And that wraps up part five. Um, so stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for part six for takeaways. Uh, for how we can defend against these uh, of these risks within the corporate enterprise. Here should be a short video. We're just going to cover some takeaways from this series. Um, so let's dive right in. So I think some of the main takeaways that you know we really want you to take away from this presentation um, is that device knowledgement is really a requirement for complex threats, right? You have to know what devices are on your network and how they behave um, in order to be able to determine what risks that they expose you as an enterprise to. Um, and to do so, right, behavioral analysis is really key here. Um, so when it comes to IoT devices, external reachability is a huge risk. Um, we went back to, you know, going back to part one and some of the statistics that were thrown out there um, in the report by NetScout, right, a device, an IoT device is typically scanned within the first five minutes that it comes online and typically targeted by a specific exploit within 24 hours of coming online. So therefore, it's a pretty safe pretty safe assumption to say that, you know, if it's internet reachable, it's likely compromised. Uh, next, we need to talk about intranetwork communications, right? And this, again, you know, really, we need to understand what this device is on the network, its actual use case, who it should and should not be talking to, right? So are these communications allowed within the network, right? When we look back at that um, Amazon Fire TV cube, right? Should that device be allowed to do UPnP enumeration and reporting? What is being sent in those communications, right? That all needs to be audited in order to understand the actual risks that these device devices present to the enterprise. Um, and again, looking at the information sent and received externally, right? What risks are we accepting here? You know, in the in the sake, uh, or sorry, in the case of the exercise bikes, 
right? They were sending out a plethora of sensor sensitive user information um, across the internet, which could be intercepted by anybody back to their home base entirely unencrypted, right? So we take a look at that, you know, that traffic again, you know, that had users that had the password, you know, username, password, MAC address, and, and that's just for the device itself. And then when it comes to the user information that's being sent, right, it had their first name, last name, age, height, weight, how much they're working out, whether or not they're um, connected to Facebook or Twitter. Um, and if they are, then those links will be included in there. Um, and so what if, what risks are you accepting when you allow these devices to talk internally, uh, or sorry, rather externally? Um, and so I think one of the main takeaways here um, in order to really prevent and to be able to, you know, finally audit these devices um, is, you know, A, having a, a network tool that will allow you to see the traffic being sent, um, see how these devices will interact with the devices on the network itself and also externally um, in order to, you know, perform some of the behavioral analysis I just mentioned. Um, but I think one of the biggest ways that, you know, organizations can really reduce the risk um, when it comes to that stuff, especially, you know, the internet or communications um, is to segment these out. Um, and when we think about, you know, having these devices being compromised or, you know, targeted by specific exploits within 24 hours, right? When we segment these devices out to their own network where, you know, it has a very hard time for that device to, to you know, or very hard time for once that device is compromised for an attacker to jump back over to, you know, your actual corporate network, um, you know, that really helps reduce the scope of attacks here. And so I hope this information is helpful uh, and please feel feel free to reach out at anyone, to anyone at AWAFE if you have any questions about this or would like to learn more. But otherwise, thank you very much for tuning in. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this and were able to take away some valuable information and at least understand the risks that are being presented uh, by having IoT devices in the network. Thanks again.